Mm. Raspberry. <laughs> you did not just do that. I'm not buzzed this time. I don't have any alcohol with me. <laughs> Screw it. Where are you going? Oh. I'm gonna need this to get... Stay awake. Oh no. No. <laughs> what have I started? Ugh. I always start something. I start a trend. <laughs> okay. You know what this is? What the? No. You hear that? Oh no. <laughs> what? He just corked something. You didn't hear this noise? He didn't. He didn't uncork. He uncorked something. He's gonna pour himself a drink. Oh! It's a cork. It'll... Cheers to the wine! Cheers to the wine! Cheers to the wine! Oh lord. Is a wise and dose. He's got a shot. Am I in full view? Yes, you're in view. Yep. It's gonna kneel. Alright, just checking. Let's get this show on the road. There can be only one. They're here. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello, welcome to Cinema Royale. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape. This is the place where we keep it classy most of the time. Let me introduce you to my bros of cinema, the brotherhood of cinema, as I would say. Uh, actually, first off for the first time, actually, is Morgan Ledger. <laughs> my battery pack. <laughs> and last but not least... Is James Sullivan also known as I'm a dude? Uh, tonight's broadcast is brought to you by 110 sit ups. Man. Man, that was a burn. Did you really get a six pack out of that? Oh, Wanna see? Oh, jeez. <laughs> nope, I guess not. There's too. I'm not doing it. My, uh... <laughs> Cover your eyes, folks. Cover your eyes. <laughs> Look, it's a goatee. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do that again. Do that again. Do that again. <laughs> do that again. Oh, hello. I'm your short naked lady. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I am the bearded lady. Oh, she'll bow down before me. All of her swimming her mind. Oh my lord. <laughs> oh, yeah, but... it's Cinema Royale, the show with the most male nudity. <laughs> but seriously, like, I'm I. For the the rest of the day, I'm just sitting in my office chair, and I'm kind of trying. I'm trying to lean back, and I'm just like, "Oh, my stomach's like a bungee cord. I'm so tight down here. I'm still, I'm still pretty tight. Uh, pretty tight for a white guy, mm -hmm. or something like that." Uh, you may notice that Matt is missing. Uh. He had personal things attending going on, so he could not be here. So he'll be here next time with Devin. So don't you worry. Good luck, Matt. Yes. And Devin is, uh... Devin is not here because, uh... Simply due to lack of interest of yes, tonight's topic, yes, but that's, that's a okay. That's fine. That's fine. She's a temporary co for a reason. She comes and goes. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Besides, look on the bright side. I've got it! 
Boom! <laughs> Bang, there goes the dynamite. <laughs> Uh, yes, tonight we're going to check out a handful of films from a defunct, notorious film company also known <laughs> as <laughs> Canon Films. Uh, are you dyslexic, Mike? Maybe, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> you decide, am I dyslexic? <laughs> defunct. Do a few tongue exercises, then try this again. Would you? It's. it's... <laughs> no, stop, stop. I can't do this. I can't do this. Mike, Mike, wait, 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 wait. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I was like, what? The... It's okay. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Okay. Um. Crap. <laughs> Can't stop laughing. Okay. Was it the mission? Was it the the bearded goatee belly button? <laughs> Maybe. I just can't believe we started off with that. Because <laughs> ah. it's it's gonna be a bearded belly button. <laughs> Uh, so, this company, Canon Films, was created by two Israeli cousins, and they had a idea in motion where they wanted to make films in Hollywood, and they... I thought they bought out the company and took it over. Yeah. Yeah, I was wrong. I don't know the massive history. <laughs> To learn Their more names. space about Canon Films, go watch Electric Boogaloo, the wild untold story Canon Films, currently on Netflix. Yeah. It is a great documentary. Yes, if you want to know more about the history of the company, go check that out. We're just here to talk about some some somewhat notorious films from that company, um, give or take. Um, so, uh, let's start out with James. We're gonna kind of go backwards in timeline-wise. So we're gonna go from 1988 to 1985. So let's start off with James with going bananas. Well, friends are love, James. <laughs> you did not take that from Bonzo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so here, uh, yeah, the the like they said. Um, like like Morgan said, watch uh, watch Electric Boogaloo. They'll they'll tell you all about these guys, um, Menahem Golem and Yoram Globus, I believe, uh, were the names. They were both main producers at this at this company. Um, they uh, they were kind of uh, they were an independent film company that. Um, that managed to actually be quite successful for a period of time until their bankruptcy in, in the 90s due to a number of reasons, uh, one of which we'll get to. And uh, the, um, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole deal, I, I believe, was Golem was, was more or less the visionary behind a lot of these projects. And Globus was mainly the money guy, and um, this uh, this particular film, Going Bananas, is actually such it it's such a departure from everything else that the that the company's known for. Um, you know, they they started out doing really skanky. Uh, uh, movies when they when they first took over the company and then they moved into just uh, doing uh, action guns tits and all this yeah they went from lemon pop school to enter the ninja mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so which is a which is a fantabulous schlockbuster uh, chop sake film mm -hmm. but um, going bananas and I, we both have a very, 
uh, interesting relationship with each other. Um, as uh, uh, as we were watching, um, as we were watching Electric Boogaloo, uh, this uh, this movie comes on about a monkey, uh, about a, to- a talking monkey, uh, who is played by. Uh, it was played by, I believe it was Deep Roy, in a, in a monkey suit. And we see several scenes from this film, uh, particularly one, uh, particularly the one that triggered me was, was one uh, with uh, the monkey visiting an unconscious child in the hospital. And I looked up, and the guys can all, they can all... Uh, uh, they can they can all testify to this. I was just like, I know that movie. I I saw that movie. And the reason why the reason why I say that is because technically, this is the very first canon film that I ever saw when I was in kindergarten. Uh, I remembered it from all the way back when. And it's such a mystery because uh, I always remember this. I was somewhere in the in the the re- in my mind that there, there was a monkey movie buried in there. Um, so it was always called. I just remembered the title was called something bananas. You know, like uh, what away bananas, Herbie goes bananas. Uh, no, I get it mixed up with the, with all these other titles, and um, so imagine we're sitting down and uh, and watching this documentary about Canon Films. This movie comes up, and it reaches out of my mem- reaches out of the back of my head, and grabs <laughs> my attention. Remember me. And uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm just kind of mystified. Like uh, they were talking in the documentary about how, how, how this movie was such a, how it was such a bomb, how much of a, of a mistake it was, and whatnot. And so when we decided to go ahead and do a, an episode of Cinema Royale on Canon, Canon Films. I just like okay, I'm rewatching Going Bananas. Mike was there. Morgan saw the Cinema Snob review, which was very timely. Oh yeah. And the story involves the son of a senator, a young a young boy who goes to Africa um, on a safari with uh, his very own personal Dom DeLuise uh, to go. Uh, yeah, just to go around, see the sights in Mo- uh, what what was it, uh, Mongo Bongo Land? Uh, something like that. It was some weird name, some fictional African name. Yeah, Mon- Mondo Wando Land. Mondo Wando and or yeah, some ridiculous name. We'll just call it Africa Land. <laughs> Africa land it's it it's it's Disneyland Africa basically yeah um yeah this the and this is why it's such a departure from their usual shtick is because this is not just a family film this is this is highly saturated in any in every sense of the word a family film uh we, he comes across a monkey while on the on the safari. The monkey, uh, the monkey likes him. Uh, starts uh, starts basically tracking them down, uh, hang, hanging out with them for the rest of the rest of the picture. And they decide to they decide to not turn the monkey in uh, beca- to the authorities because God knows what they're going to do to him. And uh, halfway through the film, they end up uh, 
that everybody ends up in prison, and out of the blue, Dom DeLuise starts prompting the monkey to speak and say banana. And uh, then later on, for some reason, the kid thinks it's a great idea, too. And eventually, yes, the monkey does say banana. 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 <laughs> and when this starts happening, Mike is cracking, is, is completely floored again. He's just throwing his head back, laughing banana. at him, sir. How, about how third this is. <laughs> and uh, that's what the movie is all about for the uh, for I the think, for the I rest think, of it is I think it's we a found tough, Mike's trigger. It's it's a t- <laughs> this film the talk monkey movie. this fucking talking monkey movie. <laughs> I swear. I was laughing cuz mind you as we were watching all these films last week to prepare for this episode, I was a little buzzed at one point. Like, I was drinking a little bit, so I was kind of having a good time. We can vouch for that. <laughs> so, I was having a good time, and I was I'm watching this movie with James, and I'm like, <laughs> laughing my ass off so much. It's just like, what is this movie? First off, before the monkey ever appears, I hear cartoon sound effects everywhere the movie goes. It's just like, you hear... I was like, is this a live-action cartoon? It's like... <laughs> That's what they were doing with it. <laughs> and then the monkey starts talking. And the monkey says, banana, banana. <laughs> I'm thinking, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and it keeps on talking more later on in the movie. I'm like, and then there's a scene where they're taking the monkey out, and they have to go through a re- and they go to, to like a restaurant, and they dress the monkey up in drag. <laughs> Just in woman's clothing. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like, you and there's actually, there's a, there's a drunk man who actually starts flirting yes, with it, I think, yes, too. Yes, yes, he starts flirting with the thought of a real woman. It's like, hey, how you doing? As I start, start dancing with it. <laughs> you don't look like other women. Your ass is hairy, but you look hot. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I I was having a good time with this. I mean, I, I kind of enjoyed it. It was it was my my kind of guilty pleasure because Dom DeLuise is great in this. The monkey is, <laughs> it's like you're thinking, oh my god, really? Is this really happening on the screen? What is what is this movie and why has it not been put on DVD yet? Exactly, it's only on VHS. <laughs> and how and how is it possible? <laughs> How is it possible that the the makers of Electric Boogaloo got a re, got some sort of re, obviously remastered cut? Because we were watching this VHS rip yeah. VHS cut of it look like look like garbage, <laughs> but it was there's it actually was, some there's actually some uh, quips they put on this poster which supposedly has review marks. Oh jeez. Mm-hmm. They say, this is on Wikipedia, by the way, I I couldn't stop laughing, this movie's so funny, it's rad, best movie in the world. (laughs) That, that's an Amazon quote, right? (laughs) That's an Amazon review. Legit, legit, on Wikipedia, as opposed to all these little critical marks and everything, it's, brother. Oh, that's on Wikipedia. Uh. Okay. (laughs) Oh. It gets even better. Oh, it gets even better. We found out it's it's actually based on a book series. <gasps> and is an Israeli book series called uh I think it was called Koriko. In the documentary they did show a, a cover and it was in English and it said the the characters' names it was like Ben, Bonzo, and then Dom DeLuise's character, whoever that was like big, big bad. Whoever so. Yeah, big bad. Uh... I can't remember what was his character's name was. Damn it, his nickname was like call me big bad. Big bad, big bad Joe Hopkins. Yeah, there it is, Joe. I'm I'm looking at it on IMDb. Okay, 
that's that's what it was. So I don't know how they got that cover. It was in the documentary, so it was like Ben Bonzo and Big Bad uh, Joe. So it's like that's the English version of it, at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were making this for a uh, English audience. Uh, I only got a, a couple of looks um, at the at the at the covers for the Corico books. It looks uh, whatever it is. Whatever it is about, um, it 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 just looks uh, completely different. Well, it's like a, their their own Curious George in a way, because uh, mm-hmm. I believe they depicted it the monkey as a orangutan, which in the documentary they do a, they do tell a funny story where they originally going to get uh, Clyde the orangutan from any which way. Any which way you can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and it's just like <laughs> it's so funny because. What if they're trying to pick... Menachem Golan <laughs> tried to freaking direct Clyde the dr- orangutan. It's like trying to tell stories. Like it's like <laughs> it's so funny just to hear what he says. Like he's talking to the monkey. He's like, "You're the monkey, Clyde. You love the kid. You love the kid. You know, and his heart is broken. His heart is broken. It's like you love the kid." And apparently, uh, they did tests and he actually bit the kid. So it's like, oh, we can't use Clyde the orangutan. We got to use a guy in a monkey suit. More or less with makeup. Mm-hmm. Actually, um, it's to to the film's credit, it's actually quite believable makeup. But uh, apparently, some some folks uh, kind of uh, kind of found it to be a bit creepy. It kind of, kind of. You is. think? Kind of is. Yeah. He looks like a. He looks like a. Shrunken down, uh, uh, Planet of the Apes character, you know. Um, Bonzo loves Ben. It's just. It's a fucking dog and monkey. Banana. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Uh. It, it, the film, oh, the overall quality of the film. Oh, oh, we haven't forgotten. Uh, here's a name that we're going to come back to. Herbert Lom. Uh, better known Good as... No. Better known as uh, Dreyfus from the uh, Pink Panther film series. Uh, he, must have had a, some, he must have had some sort of contract with, uh, with Canon Films because he was in a lot of their movies. I can only imagine how that went. Here... In this film, uh, he plays uh, a, a chief of police in this African African country who, for some reason, for some odd reason, is really obsessed with the local circus. Mm-hmm. And then, and uh, so he's uh, he's he's always in the market to get to get a, a new act for the circus, whatever it is, and we're just kind of like. What's his obsession with the circus here? And then uh, it's uh, uh, he comes across Bonzo the Talking Monkey, and guess what he's gonna do? He's gonna sell him to the circus and make a lot of money. What's what is the catch? What does he uh, what does he get out of this? Well, his big evil plan here is not to not just to go into a, a partnership with the circus ringmaster but to take over the circus this is his big this is the bad guy's big evil plan he's always wanted to run a run a, a dream circus it's it's a higher accomplishment than lollipops but um it's still that up it, it will th- yes Lollipop Dragon will always be the, the, uh, the the bottom. Yes, it will always be the bottom most uh, piece of evil, uh, to which all other forms of evil shall be compared. Browns and this is to make lollipops. And this is slightly above making evil lollipops. Um, that's how absurd this uh, this motivation is but yeah the overall quality of the film was skipping in between it, it was 
it was both being bad and so bad it was good. Yeah, it was. It's kind of in between there. For, it was just like there's some moments you just like laugh out loud, and um, some things are just so ridiculous. Like really, they actually put that on screen kind of moments. Um, uh, along with Dom DeLuise, there's also another kind of iconic comic that people might know more than anybody else. Like there was. There was Dom DeLuise and Ben. They were traveling Africa, but their guide to Africa was um, oh, fuck. I always forgot his name, character name, but he's played by um, Jimmy Walker, who you may know from Good Times. Uh, yes, he's pretending to be an uh, pretending to be an African uh, tour guide here. Yeah, he's. It's just. This film, oh my god, what... I can't believe you watched this at a young age, James, oh my lord. Well, it's the only canon film that you could sanely watch at a young age, unless your name was uh, Eli Roth. <laughs> I mean, they've... Yes, I did. yes, Morgan, I did watch the Go-Go Boys. They interviewed Eli Roth there. Uh, I heard the Go Go Boys was pro canon, but uh, how did that hold up? Um, it, it's a lot more sympathetic, and but it uh, up towards Golem and Globus, but they they talk very little about the movies and more about their more about their personal histories with each other. Um. So yeah, that's my little secret. Uh, Golem himself wrote this one. Yeah, I noticed too. that. I was like, wait, he wrote this? <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, I can understand how his writings get into it. Like, that's, it's, it's understandable. Oh, the script. Oh, my God, the writing. Uh, uh. But... I mean, I'm surprised you haven't seen like any other things like. Um... How do you go from? <laughs> there was, they did. Uh, Canon did the, uh, the fairy tale adaptations. Christopher Walken has put some boots. Yeah. Yeah, there was a whole. Oh yeah, so they. Canon movie tales. So they did. Yeah. Yeah, they don't. They don't talk very much about that. No, those period no. in the documentary, like no. What happened? There's some things that you just can't talk about a lot, especially the direct-to-video stuff they did in the '90s. Like, they were going downhill after like '86, <clears> '87, <throat> after with um, Superman for the Quest for Peace. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Rare Superman take all the nukes and then launch him into a fucking sun. Genius. Yeah, so their downfall was just because Going Bananas was probably like a direct to video. Well, it probably was released in theaters, but it was just that was the end of the era where they were releasing stuff in theaters and pushing towards like direct to video stuff. I don't know. Cyborg was released in theaters and that did marginally well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and plus. Uh, yeah, with with going bananas, they had a I, I can't remember who the child act, actor was who played Ben. Yeah, but I was I was noticing all throughout the the movie he's whoever this kid is. Uh, apparently, they previously used him in another movie, Over the Top, yep. with um, Sylvester, Sylvester Stallone, which yeah, which is on my watch queue on Netflix. Um, they uh, this kid is trying way too hard for this movie i mean like he's an amazing he's such an amazing actor like he's but he he sees bongo in the circus uh uh bon, bonzo in the circus and he's he, he's he's just like traumatized you know the i was i was looking at him like kid lighten up a little bit on the acting here <laughs> Uh, the boy's he's name. The monkey, uh, man. It's the monkey. He's from the closet. <laughs> he's he's get he's getting me, man. The monkey's here in my closet. <laughs> he's gonna get me at some point. 
the uh, child mm-hmm. actor is, uh, if I'm going to say this correctly, I might butcher it, but it's David Mendenhall. David Mendenhall. He, like I said, he was over. Okay. He, I, I talked to James about this after the movie. I was like, look in the kid's uh, filmography, and he's, you know, he was over the top with so Sly. He was, he's a prolific voice actor. Like, he was in a lot of stuff that you guys may know. He was in let's see here da 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 he he was like in the smurfs christmas special voice and character he was in saturday supercade he was in episode of the new twilight zone uh rainbow bright bursting bears gi joe it's prunky booster the transformers movie and she's over season three and four. You know, he's he's he had a lot of he's he had voice acted before he got into into these canon films. Uh Palm Puppies later on, uh Pup Names Could Be Do. Uh so you might know Okay, so he's done stuff. Yeah, he's done stuff over the years, like before canon films and afterwards. So he was he's a prolific child actor, voice actor, so he hasn't done much since mm-hmm. then, but he's good. He was a really good part of it actually. Surprised about that. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not gonna say this movie's anywhere near a classic, no. or whatnot. I'm just, uh, but the good thing that you know, after watching it again, was you know, just sort of uh, finally putting a 30 year, almost 30 year plot, uh, Matt mystery to, to to rest there. <laughs> Put that off my bucket list. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's if you want to see Dom DeLuise in a live action role, you know, you see him actually perform. He's actually really good in this. It's worth a watch. Um, if you want to see a ridiculous talking monkey, go for it. It's just, just expect batshit crazy moments. Mm-hmm. So, what do we got next, Captain? Uh, if I'm going to reverse, let's all talk about the inf- the inf- inf- infamous movie that kind of tanked canon films in general besides Superman 4, which was Masters of the Universe. Oh, I thought you were going to bring up uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. <laughs> uh, there's, pl- there's plenty of canon films to go around. Ch- Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. At the- I'm the Lord of the Harvest. <laughs> Bring it down! Bring it down! Oh man, just. Bubba's got a girlfriend. Bubba's got a girlfriend. <laughs> I can see you with a with a lighter and a coat hanger over in the corner. Yeah, yeah. E X I T exit. <laughs> we always quote that a lot of the woods. Yeah, there's. But Masters of the Universe is that one film that was oh my lord. They just mm-hmm. they just went all out with it and they just end up being bankrupt after it because it was highly budgeted for twenty two million. <sighs> well, it was said to be their Star Wars and they wanted to treat it like that. And if I remember correctly at one point they almost didn't finish the ending because they had to shut production down. So the director had to be quick on how to finish it up, and yet what we got in the end was Skeletor very cheaply falling down a pit and then coming back to life just to say, I'll be back. Yeah. Um, This is the part where Matt would have talked about this, but we're going to talk about it in general because we all seen it together as a group. So Um, Mm -hmm. I I know Morgan has some beef about what Matt has done, especially in the past when he actually put this film on the top 10 <laughs> worst movies based on a cartoon, even though Masters of the Universe is not based on a cartoon. It's even clearly stated in the credits near the end that it's based off of the toy property produced by Mattel. If I remember the story correctly, it was just based off of a cheaply made Conan the Barbarian doll, only the hair was spray painted blonde. So the guy was like, oh, there's your toy line, just a uh, Conan the Barbarian knockoff on a planet with aliens and stuff. Excuse me. But no, 
it was just a toy line, and then it became a comic, and then the cartoon series by Filmation, and then the toy line sales started declining, and they were thought, okay, maybe if we do this movie, we'll get back on top. Not a good sign. Didn't work really well, and it bombed. Mm-hmm. It was just made to sell the toys, and it just failed for that reason. Yeah, but was it was it all that bad of a film? Not entirely. I mean, it, it's a product of its time, and that's really the problem. The whole fish out of water element is done before, but it's kind of interesting here. Yeah, they are on a planet trying to digest Kentucky Fried Chicken and blend in with pink Corvettes and women's clothing. <laughs> well, you can blame Wildor for that. Yeah, they have uh, uh, they have a dimension. They basically have dimension hopping here, where He-Man and uh, all the other action figures are transported <laughs> by way of a. Uh, a key that sounds like a rock synthesizer. Yeah. Cosmic key. It's the cosmic key. Uh, <laughs> transported to transported to our planet. Yep. The suburbs of New Jersey. Where things things basically get real. And so, so hmm? apparently so apparently this key gets in the hand of Courtney Cox. Who has this really depressing story? <laughs> Which, when you really do think about it, when you compare it to Thor, there was sort of a purpose for the humans. They were scientists and everything. Here, it's like, oh, these guys have a depressing storyline. They're trying to get a band off the ground, but yet one of their parents died in a plane crash. Because, yeah, when I think of He Man, I think of depressing storylines like parents getting killed off screen. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, it doesn't it doesn't take away uh, from the experience, at least in my book. It's just sort of it's just sort of a, a plot device that's there. Yeah. And uh, it give it gives this other character some sort of motivation to just sort of randomly wrap things up by the end of the film. We won't say how because spoilers. But um, the titular uh, character He Man is played by Dolph Lundgren. Dolph Lundgren, which <laughs> in the documentary of Letcher Boogaloo, uh, apparently there's like a little side thing where he's, Sylvester Stallone walked past um, and said, "You gave that guy lines." <laughs> I will break you. Um, he, uh, this is definitely right after Rocky IV. This is like his first big role in a movie, and it's just it's his thick accent. You could clearly hear in through his dialogue, and it's just he tries his best to be He Man. And it's He Man. There's nothing, it's based on the toy, not on the cartoon. So it's just like he doesn't transform in between. Uh, two characters. He's just he's clearly He Man throughout the whole movie. Well, well, even the toys had him as a barbarian. He wasn't really a prince turning into this big right. mighty warrior. Exactly, exactly. So I just didn't, didn't want to avoid all the confusion with people associating with this movie being based on the cartoon because that's a big misconception, especially when Matt placed it on this fucking list of top ten worst movies based on a cartoon, especially at number eight, mind you. It's just, mm. it's just I don't know. I just. I mean, hey, maybe we can get the answer. Maybe we can get the answer out of next cinema, cinema lounge. <laughs> yeah, so I'll make him do like a reaction, you know, talk about his side of the story. Stay tuned for that. Um, for me, Masters of the Universe is, like I said, trying to, to be like a cheesy adaptation of the toys. It's 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 got some good qualities to it. The, the, the sets, the sets look nice. You know, they built a big set for. Castle Grayskull, and then you know they combine it into one big studio. It's really lo- nice looking. I don't know. It's just 
It's another guilty pleasure kind of movie. You sit with friends because it's just hilarious to watch it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is a pretty big guilty pleasure on my end. I have the Blu-ray for crying out loud. Um, you can tell they're trying to make this work, especially considering it's a fish out of water concept. And they do play around with those ideas and aspects, like what if these people from a different world entered our dimension? Like there's that one scene where they infiltrate a fried chicken emporium and they start eating the food and then they start realizing, oh wait, this is made from an animal. Awkward. <laughs> like, what do you eat on your planet? Seriously. That's actually a pretty good question. Well, maybe the mushrooms, because you see like a little garden of mushrooms and little dwarfs some um, place there. <sighs> I think I enjoyed the writing process for this movie. <laughs> I think I enjoy this movie because it's sort of a product of the time. It is made in the eighties. It's like, okay, what's popular at the time? Sci-fi movies, rock bands, synthesizing synthesizing music, and the principle from Back to the Future. Mm-hmm. It's a bizarre time capsule of things, mm-hmm. and that's where I find the most enjoyment out of it because it pretty much defines how strange and bizarre the nineteen eighties were. In just a nutshell. Yeah. Or at least how they wanted to be. Yeah. Especially with Frank Langella hamming up his Skeletor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I feel power coursing in my veins. I am a god. <laughs> and he turns into a flamboyant cheeky dip banana nader. <laughs> he got, I even mentioned with gold it. metallic tusks and everything. It just reminded me of Shout Shout. You shall bow down! It just reminded me of. When he transformed it, it just reminded me of Shao Kahn from Mortal Kombat. Which is just the looking of. Ugh. It was just weird. Um, they wanted to do a sequel, but they had all the costumes and set already made, but they transformed that into uh, the film known as Cyborg with Jean Claude Van Damme. Which. I remember enjoying that at least. I mean, they did they just made it into a post-apocalyptic kind of action flick, so Oh uh, yeah, the they were the company that made Van Damme pretty much. Yeah, they for Van Damme they did Bloodsport Kickboxer, I believe, and uh Cyborg was one of them. I'm trying to think that there wasn't a lot for Canon and Van Damme, some in between, but he was a late bloomer. That was like during the late yeah. 80s, early 90s. That's when Canon was going on the downfall. Um, the big stars that can't Hell, even. Hell, even one of their movies was left unfinished and they had to complete it cheaply as possible. Right. Yeah. Um, their biggest stars was. They, they used Chuck Norris a lot. They'd done. Uh, Charles Bronson, there was a big one. Um, Michael Dudikoff, which is one of my favorites, actually. I kind of wanted to talk about American Ninja and all that stuff and some other Dudikoff stuff, but that's not even worth it because these guys are not into it that much, um, more or less. Uh, I think that was it. There was, but so the, the curious case of star power, they, in the documentary, they, some guy said, oh, it's a part of my French, but it's, they, they often do a lot of star fucking. They like to get the big stars in their films. So uh, for the next one being King Solomon's Mines, they originally wanted to get Kathleen Turner. <laughs> oh, yes. From Get me the stone woman. Give me the stone woman. And they, they, <laughs> they got Sharon Stone instead, and... They they absolutely hated Sharon Stone throughout the whole process of it, and it's like, who's this fucking woman? It's just like <laughs> could... they actually said that in the documentary. Yeah. They they said this is a quote from Golem or yeah. or whoever. Who is this fucking bitch? Yeah, it's just it's like I what, what? The casting was all wrong, and even Sharon Stone had like a rough time filming both King Solomon's Mines and uh, Alan Quartermain in the. In the the Lost City of Gold, and it's just like, oh god, the first her first big acting role, and it's just like she had a stressful time. And then you got uh, Richard Chamberlain playing Alec Quartermain, which I can I liked him pretty much in the film. He was very charismatic at most. He had Alec Quartermain character down at most. This is based on a novel, by the way. 
for people up there who mm-hmm. are interested. This is it was kind of unique because Canon Film released this in 1985. It was the hundred year anniversary of the novel that came on 1885. So, yes, um, yeah, they made this one to bank off the yep. uh, to basically try and bank off this the success of the Indiana Jones film. So they have okay, there's this book character. Um, um, Alan Quartermain, who's virtually the same type of character, although you, I'm taking your thunder here. <laughs> Keep on. It's it's fine, man. It's fine. I'll be back. All right. It's just I was trying to have a difficult time trying to find a movie that everybody would appreciate. I was originally gonna do go with a ninja film and. Because Canada Films strived, thrived on ninja films for a while. They'd done Enter the Ninja, Revenge of the Ninja, and Ninja 3 The Domination, American Ninja, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Actually, 5 is not even associated with the 4. So I was like, okay, let's, let's just talk about King Solomon's Mind. Because I, I thought that was interesting. Because I was like, it's an Indiana Jones ripoff. It's, what could go wrong with it? <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I mean... Like I said, I like Richard Chamberlain as Alec Corn. I mean, he had somewhat charisma with his character, you know, funny bits here and there. But Sharon Stone's character, oh my god. Oh my god, she's a whiny little bitch throughout the whole damn thing. <laughs> no wonder she was so hard to work with. Oh, she was screaming. She's, she's the definition of a damsel in distress, even though there's a line in there that said that she's... A damsel that is not in distress or something. It was this weird line, but um, at this one point they get hop into a plane, and <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> she, she has no idea what the what the plane. She has no clue about the plane, and she's looking out the side. There's brown glue glue slipping on the side. <laughs> Just singing. No, you got to do it right. You got to do it right. There's some brown goop leaking out the side. I, I was just like, how dumb is she? How dumb is she? And she sang that just like because she was freaking out. It's like, <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing after that. Oh. And I'm looking at, I had to rewatch that part of the film just because, just, just for laughs. And I realized something. I don't even see any brown goop leaking out the side. That's... So like, what is she? What is she talking about? What is she talking <laughs> about? That's even better. Oh my god. Um. Okay, the plot is very convoluted because it, Alan Quartermain's there to help find uh, Sharon Stone's um, father character, thing about Bob, and uh, they go on this venture. Who's an archaeologist? Yeah. So that's only. Really, I guess. I guess. Or they wanted to find some lost treasure of the map, and you, you can really translate it, and there's a couple of big baddies that try to avoid uh, and kill Alec Holder Main. It's a big, it's kind of like a big, long chase between the two. It's like, he ends up following him, and they follow him. They go uh, on a train. They do. They go on a plane. Um... It, they did. They do some uh, crotch shooting. <laughs> it's it's all over the place with this film. It's just like it doesn't stop to breathe. It just keeps going and going and going until they get to the end where they <laughs> they end up finding the jewels and the treasure. Spoiler word, and <laughs> and they try to get away from the baddie. <laughs> And I swear to God, he, he, of course, there's like a trap, a booby trap within the water. It's like they're going across this little lagoon kind of thing. There's a booby trap. The guy gets sucked under, but all of a sudden this rock hippo comes out of nowhere and chomps him like a hungry, hungry hippo. It's like, where did that come from? <laughs> where did that come from? Out of nowhere, just a rock like statue of a hungry, hungry hippo. Maybe it was the maybe it was one of the gargoyles from the Hunchback of Notre Dame, you know. <laughs> it was a hippo, a uh, hippo gargoyle. <laughs> it's yeah. It, it this is not Indiana Jones. 
this is definitely not any Nia Jones, especially mm-hmm. King Solomon's mind. I did not watch El Cordomain and The City of Lost Gold because I didn't have time to watch it, but I heard that was way worse than King Solomon's mind. Like, oh my god. But um, this film, uh, it was, it, it got, like like I said, Sharon Stone's character is just it's really annoying, and I did not stand her. Do you like Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's a running gag. His, uh, Alec Cordomain's catchphrase in this movie, oh my god, his catchphrase in this movie is, I got this. I got it. I got it. I got it. He, he, okay, so it started off with this, uh, guy who they meet up to find information about where the whereabouts of the father is on the map. And he's trying to escape, and he's got a stick of dynamite in his hand. He says, I got it. And all of a sudden, he goes, boom. <laughs> I got it. Boom. <laughs> and that's how it's, it's all started from there. And all of a sudden, Alec Cordomain goes around, and he's like, I got it. I got it. <laughs> it's like, oh, God, this is the catchphrase. This is the catchphrase of Alec Cordomain. Oh, my God. And now, now it became our personal catchphrase. <laughs> yeah. Our own well, they're... running gag. There's a well. There, there's a bit more precedence towards the, uh, the, uh, the dynamite scene, but um, that you basically said the gist of it. Yeah. It, that was the one part of the film that was so beautifully executed. We're we're just talking about the dynamite. Oh, I thought you were talking about my door, my table, well, my statue. I didn't mention that. I didn't mention that, but yeah, that same character who ended up being blown up by the dynamite, he's just, just like, so sympathetic for his stuff, like, the door knocks down, my door, and the table's like, my table, oh, my statue. <laughs> this guy has the easiest lines in the movie. Uh, we kept talking about the entire, entire movie. Uh, my door, my table, my statue, bam, my balls. <laughs> We we couldn't believe that part either. They, they there's a oh, yes. scene where they're, where they're on the train, where they're on the train, and he's, you know, Sharon Stone's been captured, and there's some, you know, there's, uh, there's some rapist Nazi what have you, uh, talking about about to do things to her, and Alan Quatermain's underneath the floorboards. He pokes the pokes the gun barrel up through the floorboards and shoots the guy in the crotch and he he takes off like a rocket like you know, whoa you, you know what would have been more distasteful if he just said good bad i'm the bastard with the gun <laughs> and that at that point i just said to the guys that's why they call it a nut shot exactly it's like one of the best nut shots in life uh, i got it <laughs> Like, what was up with that? Because then afterwards, that became, like, a running thing for him. I know. It's just... like, like, even the guy's dead. Like, Alan Quartermain holds up a cigar. I got it. Fakes that it's a thing in time. It really is a thing in time. And he says it again and again and again and again. Is that his catchphrase? Is this, like, a little doll that I'm going to pull the string and says, I got it, and then the doll explodes? <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Yes, the Alan Quartermain mar- merchandise section. You can you can buy it at KB Toys, you know. <laughs> oh wait, KB Toys was a thing in the eighties. Never mind. Man, I miss that store. Oh man, it's it's just King Solomon's mind is just like, what did I get myself into? It's just I just went on a whim. It's like, all right, fine, I'll do a f- some adventure film because everybody else went with something else different. Like, I'm glad you guys found something enjoyable in there. I was there during that screening. I found it actually really tiresome. Like, it was nonstop action. It never knew when to take a break. And by the time we got to, like, the second or third tribe encounter, I was, like, passing out. All I remember is, like, closing my eyes, hearing the sound, and, like, slowly waking up to when they find the diamonds, and they're, the bad guy's about to get him, and he's on this little trap where the rocks go down, and he gets killed by a hungry, hungry hippo. Yeah, it's just... Yeah, <laughs> see, that is the... That is the... That's Sorry, what? That's all I remember. That's all I remember. I remember them going into this tribe, just clocking out, and then waking up again when they're in this cave, and the guy gets eaten by a hippo. 
Yeah, I know. I remember that. I was like, oh, <laughs> he woke up at a good part. It's like, huh? Hungry, hungry hippo? <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. yes, that's how, yes, that's how our good friend Dreyfus dies in this movie. <laughs> Herbert Long strikes again. The other thing that would make it even funnier if he just yelled, I will kill you, hippo! I will kill you! <laughs> uh, <sighs> but, um, yeah, and I, I think Morgan brings up, like, the, the main thing that's just a, that's just a killer for the film, not, not even being Sharon Stone, not even being close. Um, she, um, the, the problem with the film is, it um it it doesn't know when to stop it doesn't know when to to actually tell us who these characters are expand upon their relationships with one another there's one really brief scene with uh Alan Quatermain and Sharon Stone's character inside of a inside of a a giant bowl of soup oh, yeah, was, where they're just sort that. of yeah uh where they're just sort of uh uh, having this moment together, which is supposed to later lead to a romance. Big spoiler alert right there. But it doesn't feel like anything. Like, these characters, there's no, there's no, there's not enough chemistry in between yeah, the two of them. Yeah, the only a... thing it leads to, is, the only thing it leads to is the upside down people, and that's about it. Yes, yeah. that scene. The upside down tribe. Uh, that, that just... They just do everything. How, how do you think the lunch breaks would have been? That would have been really awkward. I don't yeah, know. They're just, okay, we're just sort of suspended over the lunch tables. All right, got, got me uh, all right, got me a hot dog? Okay. Mm, mm, that's good. Cause, cause I can only imagine just how, how hard that would have been just to hang down on those vines for like hours and hours on end filming that scene. Yeah, but that was, that was a... That's a unique scene. That was like, wow, okay, that, okay. Um, no, there's a bullshit moment where, like James said, there was a scene where they're, uh, they're gonna be eaten by cannibals and they're put in this big pot of soup, more or less, and they're trying to escape, and they, <laughs> he, had, he, Alan Quartermain ends up swimming down to see, looking around, and they, you clearly see it's like a fish tank where it's glass where you can see it, and. And he's like, okay, come on down with me. And they start moving the teeter tottering the whole thing. It's like with their bodies, like they, they they're trying to push it over. And I'm thinking, what? How are you? How you don't have the force to knock that thing over with all the water inside? It's just. Yeah. Yeah. What do you swim attack against the the side of the, the side of the bowl there? It's just it made no sense. And then it starts. <laughs> it gets funnier because. They end up t tipping it over that it ends up rolling downhill. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's it just it's a nonstop ride that you can't breathe at. Like it, if you're gonna watch, it's like it, if you want if I don't know if, I don't I I kind of enjoyed it because there's some hilarious parts in it, but it just I wouldn't watch it again. It's just, it's, yeah. I'm not a big adventurer kind of person. It's just like it's, it's, it's there. It's just, it happened. Like there's got to be knockoffs of Indiana Jones because it's popular. Even yeah, they, I mean, and even they did one before that, Treasures of the Four Crowns in 3D. Oh, that sounds in. Oh, I know which one you're talking about. That's um. Um that wasn't even related to that it was um there's a journey to the center of the earth kind of movie i thought jules verne yeah it was like it was it was cause that, that was like one of them the adventure films they had that was like the journey to the center of the earth but they titled it completely different i think that's what it was i remember correctly but yeah it's just but okay i want to say one last thing but the in the documentary, they talk about Alec Quartermain, about both films, and how they didn't like Sharon Stone, but for Alec Quartermain and the City of Lost Gold, they're mentioning how they don't, he, the director doesn't hear nothing from the guys, uh, Yolom and those guys, and they're watching it for the first time, 
and they're reacting to oh, it. Oh, you mean you mean you mean the the Lost City of Gold movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Alan Cormier and the Lost City of Gold. So they're watching it, and they assume they were watching <laughs> Invaders from Mars. <laughs> they got they just then there's no communication between the directors at all. They, they don't know what's going on, and they don't admit they're confused by what they're doing. So they just it's like why why are these why is the queen so beautiful they're supposed to be ugly why are the people's dressed in white and like pajamas so if you are interested in seeing a Indiana Jones knockoff Alec Quartermain in King Solomon's Mine and Alec Quartermain in The Lost City Gold could be your guilty pleasure if you will yeah I mean what what is what was even his job what what was his career exactly? Was he just, uh, was he an archaeologist? Was he a tour guide who just uh, liked to get into a lot of trouble? That's a good question. <laughs> I think if you re- they don't I, I, I actually explain I, I, movie. I, I actually, I skip the movies. Just read the original novels. Just go and check mm-hmm. and read the original novels. It's just that's better than that. Uh, we're saving the last bit of the podcast for the best. Berserk movie Canon Films has ever made. Let's give that to Life Force. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. It's oh, one of the so most high class Canon films. Oh, yeah, I thought I was going to go with the Dev Wish 2. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, where to begin with this movie? I've heard about it. I've never seen it up until now. Um, Toby Hooper is one of my favorite horror directors. He's no John Carpenter, but I like how he captures that whole B-movie feel with his movies. Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is definitely a big one that he's well recognized for, but sometimes he can always capture like the goofier side of horror films. And I think with this one, he wanted to mesh the two styles together. He wanted like a very serious edgy horror movie and at the same time just have fun with it and I think he sort of succeeded in a sense creating one of the most strangest totally weird films to ever exist from the canon company I enjoyed every minute of it (laughs) Mm. Uh, I think what I remember best is Leonard Leonard Maltin's review of it claiming that it was just complete uh, describing it under one adjective Berserk. First, it's a space movie like Alien, where all these astronauts go out to space and they find this ship inside Haley's Comet. And, like, there's these space vampires that they take aboard. And then, afterwards, the craft disappears and it gets destroyed and stuff. <gasps> and they find the craft with the uh, vampire people in there and they bring it back to Earth. And sure enough, it becomes a vampire movie afterwards. With these aliens running around and literally sucking the life out of people and turning them into like mummified corpses. And then the mummified corpses come to life and start sucking the life energy out of people and they're infected and everything. And if they don't get a fresh host in the next few hours, they just explode and turn to dust. It is, it is glorious in that. It, it doesn't get any crazier than that. And they have this one person who's, like, infected because he fell in love with one of the beautiful vampire people who's naked throughout the whole movie, might I add. I, I wonder if they had heating lamps every and blankets on, on every set. Considering, every how, shoot. considering how you were seeing Oliver, and I do mean Oliver, I wouldn't be surprised. So then you have the male character that's like, oh, part of me became inside of her, and I was fascinated with her, so I'm part of her. It's like that cheesy kind of thing. It reminded me of Night of the Blood Beast, where an astronaut gets sucked into space and gets impregnated by this weird mole-like creature <laughs> with this oh, I'm shrimp inside his stomach. <laughs> oh, I'm sure part of him was inside of her. <laughs> like, oh. That's, like, like, that's what... Oh, brother, the jokes I go with. Like, that's what this movie really reminded me of. It was like the classic trash from the 50s. Like, like all the Roger Corman Z movies, like Night uh, Attack of the Killer Leeches and stuff like that. But it was trying to do it on, like, a bigger budget and be, like, really interesting and everything and really throw everything at it. 
I think that's where the enjoyment of the movie came from. Like, it knew it was garbage. It knew it was trash. But the way it was developing it was like at the pace of a Star Trek Next Generation episode. Hell, they even have Patrick Stewart in this movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, even that was a big surprise where... Spoiler alert. Where he gets infected by one of the aliens, or it's one of the aliens in the skies. And, like, there's a scene where they hypnotize it. <laughs> and the guy who's infected throughout the whole movie, the astronaut who's infected throughout the whole movie, has a little small make-out session with Patrick Stewart. <laughs> I am not even killing, kidding. Of all you Star Trek fans out there, here's your fan fiction moment. Of all the things you talk about, why you never talk about this movie? And it's Patrick Stewart making out with an infected astronaut. By force. It's like, no, no, I don't want to do it. And apparently you thought it was glorious. <laughs> I'm surprised too, James. You talked about the scene where blood leaks out of his mouth. I'm surprised I didn't freak out over this scene. What, uh, over over yeah, Patrick yeah. Stewart getting made out with? Yeah. I, I mean, Why would I... You, you, you're, you're grossed out over one effect, and yet you don't have a problem with this. Because <laughs> it's, no. Patrick, it's Patrick Stewart, Captain the Card. Well, I... <laughs> he would, you, he would you be Scrooge. He would be Scrooge in a Christmas Carol. Really I think about that. <laughs> Well, no wonder he was a Scrooge. But seriously. <laughs> but seriously. Oh, I've, I've watched... My heart. In, in every other TV show nowadays, they, they, they gotta have a, like w- at least one gay character in every sitcom, so it doesn't really shock me, you know? It's or even just... if it's not a sitcom, just a dramedy. It's just that, of all people, Patrick Stewart, Professor Xavier, this just amazes me. Exactly. Like, like he's going through, and he's like, okay, I'm an a- I have an alien trapped inside of me, and I'm just going to go with the flow and really give it my all. And the fact that he just literally goes with it, like, all the way, <laughs> really impresses me. Oh, yeah. But still, though, that, uh, that... That blood effect was pretty amazing. I, I'm just, I'm wondering if that was slow motion reverse. Uh, From the looks of it, I'm pretty sure it was definitely in camera. Like they obviously had to tilt the the camera and everything just to make the effect work. It's probably the same thing they did with the um, the bloody bed from Nightmare on Elm Street. Mm. It's another thing too. It's weird because this film really jumps a lot. Like first it's alien, then it's a vampire movie, and then the ending it's like an apocalypse, which is amazing. <laughs> it's like you went from point A to point B. Now it's point Z. It's like okay, we're giving up. We're just kind of like this big apocalypse and everything, and people are going crazy and they're drinking the zombies and stuff. Oh yes. And and, and, I'm, and I'm trying sorry. not to give and I'm trying not to give too much away because there's a lot of stuff that's go that goes on. You got the public of London getting their life removed. You have the infected astronaut who's trying to rekindle with the female vampire. The possibility that they may survive or not, and that they go back inside the spaceship and everything. It's like trying to connect the dots. It's a very bizarre movie. Like. Of all the movies that Canon has made, this truly is one that definitely goes off the rails. I have not seen a movie in a long time outside of today, <laughs> which starts off in an interesting way and it just spirals out of control, but yet somehow manages to keep the enjoyment all together. If you do see this movie, I recommend the director's cut, because it does add a lot of substance to the whole thing. Supposedly, when they were releasing it over in America, they made a lot of trims. Uh, most notably, the whole vampire mythos connection was sadly stripped from the film. So if you do see it, I do recommend the director's cut. In fact, I recommend seeing this movie all together. It's insane. The, the, the effects are great for the time. They still hold it pretty well. The acting, oh, is, yeah. pretty, the acting is pretty decent. Um, but like I said, it has the pacing of... 
a hammer horror movie, but in space. It doesn't get any crazier than that. Yeah, the well, that that's one thing that you mentioned there was uh, was actually something that um, I didn't. I, I felt sort of detracted from the film, at least upon initial viewing, until you explained it to me. Um, the the whole connection to the vampire mythos, it seems. It's it it seems like this movie or or at least one character has come to that conclusion uh, that uh, because these beings had been somewhere there before, God knows how many years ago, uh, that here now here's something for our listening audience that we that I don't think we've made clear these guys they're not really vampires they suck the life force out of you vampires drink blood out of the neck typically now but these guys just sort of do this <gasps> face hug and then electricity oh yeah elect the electricity from your body gets sucked into theirs uh, that's that's how it works and that's actually very clever well, well, well it's um, based off of a book called the space vampires yeah, I was gonna mention that most of the stuff we talked about are based on books which is pretty simple to convert into film but yeah this is based on the, the space vampires yeah. James if you ever do something on canon you're gonna have a long request line oh yeah because canon films did a lot of book to film adaptations I don't know if I'll have the time <laughs> you're, James you're still young you do it go to Patreon go to Patreon donate like mad donate like mad requesting people if you want to see James to do it page for pages to pictures on a canon film, go ahead. Oh Make it boy. Life first. <laughs> oh my god. What have we done now? But yeah, the they have one character who comes up and uh, who's uh, like a mythos professor or something just says, I believe, I firmly believe that these uh, these creatures were the original inspiration behind our mythological vampires. And I, I really thought when you, uh, so there was something about the way that he put it, it just felt like a stretch to me. Well, but there's, there are some differences between the book and the, and the film, so it's just that they took some liberties with those space vampires, at least. And, and like I said, there are two cuts in this movie. One that retains the vampire mythos, while the other one, like, literally strips it out of the movie. Yeah, mind you, this is distributed by TriStar Pictures. So, if you got the TriStar uh, cut, that's the one you don't want. Because they cut a lot out of it. Maybe. Mm. Anyway, it yeah, it's a good film. I'm not gonna. It's it's a shame too because a year after we get Little Shop of Horrors, and that originally had an apocalypse finale, I'm kind of thinking that, in a sense, if that movie had the original ending with the plant eating the world, we would pretty much have two movies that end in a very bonkers fashion, and both in an apocalyptic like setting. Only one has. E uh, life force sucking aliens. The other has giant plants eating people. Oh my god! I never thought. Really about... think about it. Wow. And, and and both have like huge model work. When you think about it. Oh wow, that's that's a great double feature actually. Watch back. I'd like that to happen. There you go. Science fiction. Ooh. Double feature. Sure. And some crazy woman plays the creature. Yes, men. With there's... brown goop dri oh. dripping out the side. There's brown goop on the side. Oh, God. Any final thoughts on canon films and any films in particular? Uh, Matilda May is the sexy space girl. <laughs> uh, French. Those French girls, ooh la la. 
I actually give her all the way committed. It, I, I, you know, I read up she was a little uncomfortable doing it, but like, ugh, all the power to her. She did a really good job oh, yeah. playing that role. She was like the female Terminator. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Like, th- actually, I kind of want to get this movie from my brain now. Um, oh, now I have two Matildas to look up to <laughs> Martha and May. <laughs> Oh. Somewhere, somewhere in the future, it's like 25 years from now, it's going to be like the Red Room from Twin Peaks. I'm going to have Mara Wilson, Matilda May, the talking backwards guy. <laughs> oh, boy. If it doesn't happen, my God. It'll be one hell of a dream. <laughs> Gar Stelk! That gum you like is back in style! <laughs> Twin Peaks reference flew over my head. Oh, oh we, for- we forgot, we forgot! The Twin Peaks! It keeps our minds! It keeps all the minds! Yep. They're like Twin Peaks! The Twin Peaks, yep, that was in there. Uh, my door, my table, my statue, my mountains. Uh, uh, for me in general, I I love this company to death. Like their films make me so enjoyable. Like I've watched a majority of their films so far. I, I continue to watch their films. Like the the history behind the company and the films they make is an interesting. A uh, little nugget of history for film and cinema for us. So it's clear with Canon Films, they didn't want to make movies to be part of the norm. They wanted to make movies simply for themselves. And you can see that with stuff like Bolero and um, trying to think of another good example, like the Death Wish films. It's clear they're in it just for the entertainment mm-hmm. value. They weren't in it just to, like, get rich or anything. No, they wanted to make movies just to make movies. And even if they weren't that good, they still did it with flair. Because at least when you do think about it, if you see, like, a bad canon film, you still got something to talk about at the end. Exactly. Like, like legitimately, Bolero is about this woman trying to save her lover who's a bullfighter who gets gored in the nads. Oh, yeah. That thing is going up! <laughs> Man, there's just so many canon films that that we could talk about. Like, there's, the library's extended. Oh my god, oh, man! If, if Invaders from Mars. Yes, God. If if you guys want us to do a part two in the future, we can totally do that for you guys. We can talk about more canon films. But uh, and if you donate now to our Patreon, you'll be able to see Matt talk about Superman Four: The Quest for Peace. <laughs> Click that like button if you want to see Matt talk about Superman for the quest for peace. Send mail! Can you picture how that would be? Like, bags and bags of mail just coming out of nowhere, just like Miracle on 34th Street style bullshit. <laughs> yes, okay. Yeah, letters! Say. Letters! All for Matt who wants to see him talk about Superman 4 quest for peace. We're gonna see what's in the box. But first, a long pile of letters. Uh, dear Matt, could you do something for Canon Films? Canon Films. 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 I think I'm going to get him for Christmas now. Oh my god, yes. Do, do it, because it'll be good for a future episode. Doing that. <laughs> Matt, 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 if you're watching this, you're gonna get something good for Christmas this year. Don't worry, it's nothing bad, but I promise you, it will have tits. Well, hey, what about me? My birthday's coming up. <laughs> Shit. Oh, yes. Yeah, 
so. <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll do something. Uh, it's okay. Oh, it's man. okay. Man, oh man, I just this this company just blew. Like once they discovered Canon Films, I was just like, oh my god, I'm in heaven. Like I'm a type of guy who likes the '80s, as you guys know. It's my trope on this podcast. I love the '80s so much, but this 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 goes beyond that. Like I love action films, and this these action films are so over the top, <laughs> over the top. <laughs> it's it's unbelievable. Like they they, 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 they I, 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 it blows my mind. That's why I love canon films so much. They just they. They take what you expect and they just flip it on top of everything. They just flip it and put a twist on it or something. They just it's it's mindless action at most for most of them. I feel bad how in the nineties they started dragging on and even then the uh Globus and what's the other guy's name? Uh, Gollum. 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 Sorry, thank you. They kind of split yeah, the Menahem ways. Gollum and Yoram Globus. If they went on for a few more years, it would be interesting to see them compete against each other, because they try that with the Lombada dance. Yeah, they've done. They'd split at one point, and they'd started doing their own films independently. So they started to compete with each other at one point. Yeah. Yeah, one was 21st century. The other was like regular canon. Yeah. I'll, I'll never. Oh, yeah. I'll never forget one of the reactions when they were looking at the box office receipts of the movies and it was underwhelming. I, I try to remember one of the two. One of them said as the idea, okay, we got it. There's, an, there's a good way to save it. We Make got it! it. Lombada. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they they were so committed to what they did. I And this is one, one thing I got about, you know, after watching the Go-Go Boys was... Uh, um, they were so committed uh, to making movies. Uh, Golem described himself as being married to the Hollywood system, and that and that was kind of a shame because uh, his his wife actually uh, his his wife actually divorced him at one point and took the kids back to Israel. Um, uh, he was. He was too busy uh, being a businessman uh, and not a dad, and that was that was one that was one thing that the that the film was sort of made that that documentary was sort of made to apologize for because they've got interviews with his kids all grown up and whatnot, mm-hmm. and uh, you know he's just saying you know what I'm I'm sorry I wish I could have been a better father, and there's this one beautiful moment though at the end of it. They they give you the impression though that that there's really no hard feelings between them, and uh, they end with an interview of Golem and uh, Globus. Are you crying, Mike? It's a beautiful moment, James. Keep going. Keep going. It's beautiful. Keep going. And <laughs> and so they they just sort of uh, ended off with that, and then they. I think they surprised him with uh, by have by having uh, Globus walk on walk on camera with him, and they have this little interaction with each other. And they're sitting down at the in the credits, and they and you just see them in the in the movie theater with some popcorn, watching their old movies. Wouldn't it be great if they're watching Life Force? <laughs> they did. They did bring up life force a little bit, but it wasn't really anything. Oh. It wasn't anything new that uh, that Electric Boogaloo hadn't really hadn't already talked about. Yeah, I figured that much because Toby Hooper had that three p- three picture deal, and it makes me wonder if those movies went better than expected. Like, would the company go on or anything of that much? Because even then, what interested me the most was how Ken was, like you said. They were very, very determined with how they were making films. Even when they went to like the Cannes Film Festival, they always proposed these ideas movies which never came to, like James Cameron's Spider Man and stuff like that. Yeah, they would they had they had their own system of how they would make films. They would uh 
do a film, take the profits from that movie, make another movie, sell it overseas, and just keep going with that until they have enough money. I don't know. Just Hell, well, we didn't even talk about the Hercules movie where the bear goes to outer space. Yes, yeah, those are those two. Yeah, those Hercules films with Lou Ferrigno. Uh, there's so many... So many, and we, we even touched, I think that for canon films, the 80s is their golden era of film. Um, they started way earlier than that, they started like in the 70s, maybe the 60s at most, but yeah, they, the 80s was a big nugget for their films, like, wow. In the 90s, we kind of went drifted out, so it's just that, yeah. just the in-between. The in it, it, it was pretty much all about the rainforest when we hit the 90s. But... Not too long ago, there was an out, sort of an announcement made. Oh, uh, you're gonna bring that up. They, uh, uh, if I remember, I don't know who. It's kind of like a resurrection of the, the. I wouldn't say the company, but it's like a similar company where they're gonna do like reboots of their old films, or somebody's gonna do a reboot of their old films. Like they're gonna do another, um. Another Alicorn movie. They're gonna do another American Ninja movie. They're doing another Kickboxer movie. They're just rebooting these with. I I. I... If if that's the case, what I really like to see. Hmm. Not a Life Force sequel. Not not a Life not a Life Force reboot, but a Life Force sequel. Or like maybe something along the lines of like The Force Awakens, like a whole new generation of energy vampires and stuff like that. And they have to, like, fly to, like, Pluto or something to find the original one just to stop them. Well, well they're kind of, like, making sequels. I don't know. They just, the, the press release for it just was very confusing. Like, they said that the, 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 the rights to all the films are still there, but they couldn't, like, get the rights. Like, they're trying to make these movies without voiding the rights from the other companies who have the films. It's, it's, it's unique, and I'm kind of... I think, uh... Go on. Well, yeah, because, like, some of them are owned by MGM now, and MGM is, you know, on its own and stuff like that, just shipping these films, so I can imagine the licensing fee would be pretty difficult. And I think, uh, I think Golem is actually on board with this. Oh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. One of them? Yeah, so... Yeah, because, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, I think that's what it is, I think, because one of them's kind of like along with it but yeah so at least you got one half of the canon uh, producers doing it mm -hmm. I mean because the other one died so I'll never forget his reaction when he found out his partner had cancer the only thing he said was he never should have left me yeah that was kind of touching like they I mean they're just the bestest of friends they're cousins at most they just had a good time together you know make these films and it's just the downhill of it all just split them apart eventually. I don't know. It's just it's one of those stories you just have to go into and just it's it's unbelievable. Yeah. Mhm. Mm uh, well, well, best of uh, best of luck for this new generation. Yeah, they're. I'm kind of interested, kind of intrigued what they're going to do with this new generation of films. Because they're, they're kind of like sequels, more more or less reboots, reboots, maybe. I don't know. I'm just interested to see. It. Well, the closest we have so far is like Olympus has fallen. Well, at the end of The Legend of Boogaloo, they do, during the credits, they mention that without canon films, we wouldn't have all the films we have today. So, like ninja films mm -hmm. and action films, you know, all these crazy stuff. So. I guess, and of course the ultimate masterpiece that is Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Really, do the math. A lot of that trash really came from canon. That, that golden, golden trash, like science fiction and everything. It wasn't just like uh, the thing or anything. Like we're talking about, like really cheesy, cheesy kind of things, like planets and stuff like that. Like. Flash Gordon, all that kind of stuff. That's like a small fraction. No, think about it. Without canon, it wouldn't be like the stuff we have today. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's 
just that's why I try to play, play tribute to that because God, they just do so much for us. Um, now, if I only imagine that's... now, if if Ken was still alive, I bet you they do like a reboot of Manos: The Hands of Fate as a musical. <laughs> Make it happen. Torgo, tell me, do your car and getting all your luggage off the car. Here I go, I'm staggering to the door. Oh man, too much bourbon in my system. Hope you don't mind. Here I am, carrying these things on my back. Makes me heavy, heavy, heavy lug. <laughs> uh, you, sir, are a comic genius. Hey. <laughs> this is what happens when years and years of whose lines anyway binges in my system. <laughs> That show warped my mind as a kid. It's a good use. In glorious ways. Oh, man. So, next time on Cinema Royale, we're going to dive, dive, a dip our toes back into sequels once more for a third time, our third installment of sequels, this time focusing on the third quill, or the third movie in the series of a franchise. Um, it's going to be an interesting one. Everybody's going to be back for it, so don't fret if you didn't haven't seen Matt or Devin in this episode. So it's going to be all right. It's going to be a full crew talking about yep. the best of the best or the worst of the three cools. Three. Imagine numbers three people. Imagine numbers three. So. And there will be blood. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, it's going to be an interesting talk. So uh, until next time. Thanks for listening, watching. Uh, comment below what is your favorite Canon film. Uh, do you want us to check out other film companies besides Canon? Um, so yeah, thanks for listening, watching, and uh, long, live si long live cinema. Long live cinema royale. Banana. 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 Bonzo likes Cinema Royale. Wouldn't we agree that Elizabeth, if that would be the new penis game, just kids around the yelling banana and McDonald's? <laughs> banana. 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 Uh, how about uh, if they're gonna if, if they're yes. if, if the new if the new canon is fixated on uh, on uh, doing reboots or sequels and whatnot, how about rebooting Going Bananas more yes. oh my more God. accurate yes. to the book? More accurate to the books. I can see it now. And listen to the credits. The stunt double for Bonzo is dubbed Harry Butt Boy. <laughs> I totally forgot about Big Boy and freaking Masters of the Universe. <laughs> what? Freaking Big Boy. Fucking the contest winner for being in Masters of the Universe had a little bit. Oh! Big oh. Boy. Are we still recording? Yes. Cool. We're, we're finally talking about Big Boy. <laughs> okay, so for those who don't know, there was a contest they had where you can be in the movie. But unfortunately, due to the script obligations and filming, it was very, very last minute, and the director said, you know what, you get a bit part, you get to hand Skeletor his staff, and it's like near the tail end of the movie, you see like a shot of like this pig creature handing Skeletor the staff, that is the winner of the contest. I almost forgot about that, I was just like... Okay, I read it. I was right. Hey, guys, there's 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 gonna be a little bit where there's gonna be a contest winner from a contest. There's gonna be a pig boy. He's gonna watch out from. There he is. <laughs> yep, he had that one big crucial role, handing out handing off the the scepter. Money well spent. I wonder how many can I wonder how many candy bars he ate in order to get the proof of purchase to be in the contest. <laughs> Jeez. Cause, cause let I wonder, me you, look, cause let me I wonder you, you look like a pig. Because let me tell you, when I was 11, when I was 11, I remember there was a tie-in for Hershey's where you could get, like, this Spider-Man poster, but he had to, like, have 20 proof of purchases. Oh, really let that sink in. Oh, my God.
That's a lot that? of cereal. Cereal? I'm talking about chocolate bars. Chocolate. Whatever. Oh, so many Reese's, so many Hershey bars, so many Kit Kats. <laughs> so was, much diabetes. Uh, but it was well spent. Oh, man. I, I sold that poster, too. It's actually pretty cool. Nice. Sweet. There you go. There's your bonus little scene, people. Thanks for listening. Banana. 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 Canon Films. The home of high-powered, high-voltage motion picture entertainment. With the screen's biggest spectacles, brightest stars, and boldest lineup of explosive entertainment. We're taking motion picture excitement over the edge and your box office over the top. We're Canon Films, and we're Dynamite.